You're listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. 2022 will forever be etched in my mind as the year that travel and tourism rebounded from the pandemic in a truly massive way. Essentially, since June 1st, or whenever the remaining travel restrictions lifted, the visitors haven't stopped trickling into the city. I also know this from experiencing a major uptick in requests for my own tour. Now that we're well into the fall and peak travel season is behind us, I wanted to sit down with someone who has spent the last decade of his career in tourism, understands how it's evolved, and has actually come to build something new. A year ago, Simon Burke launched Chango Tours, a business that takes visitors through Paris and beyond on a sidecar. I'm all for seeing the city in unique and unexpected ways, so I'm excited to get to talk to Simon all about the business. Good morning, Simon. Good morning, Lindsay. (laughs) <laughs> How are you? It's Monday. Uh, it is going to be a rainy week in Paris. Uh, sounds like it's, I mean, it's, 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 we're, we're, we're heading into sort of more traditional Paris weather. How do you feel about that? I'm thrilled. It's been too hot for too long. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. In fact, when I met you this summer, I think it was like a, a, a freakishly cooler summer day. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we, we've had a scorcher. I can, you know, given, given the line of work you're in, which we're going to talk about being out in the heat adds an element of, uh, complexity and certainly fatigues you faster, I would assume. Yeah. 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 Uh, most definitely the, the heat just, it's a different type of bone tired. It's, it's weird. And I, (laughs) I don't feel like I handled it all that well, but you know, a bathtub full of cold water certainly helps at the end of the day. Yeah, interesting what, what tactics we resort to. Once we figure out, like, what actually brings the temperature down, it's like, you know, get those ankles cold, get the, you know, just bring the, the body temperature down as fast as possible. But anyway, enough about, you know, our, you know, burning planet. Um, You are something I didn't realize when I met you this summer at a picnic at the Bouchemont. You are actually uh, French. Your name is Simon Burke, but you are French. That's correct. I don't sound on you paper don't sound... or in person like a Frenchman. <laughs> but I find this very interesting. Um, I always find this interesting because I think it really lends something, you know, obviously something very compelling to someone's identity, but also uh, you, you know, you bring something else to the table in the work that you do because you have such varying perspectives. So can you tell me a little bit about your background and, you know, where's your family from and how long have you been living in Paris? Sure, sure. Um, the The easiest way to, um, to lay it out is right out of my four grandparents. One of them was American. That's the paternal grandfather. So that's why I have... Um, well, an Irish last name, right? He was American with Irish heritage. And the other three, uh, one of them, my paternal grandmother, she was from Strasbourg. She was uh, an Ashkenaz Jew from Strasbourg. And then on my mom's side, they were both uh, very strictly Catholic from Lorraine. So also on the German border. So uh, by the whole French side of my family, they're all kind of, you know, Rhine River Valley uh region and so you know depending on how far back you go they were either french or german but never moved right it's just the border that kept flip-flopping back and forth um and so my parents they uh they grew up bouncing back and forth between france and germany and then moved to the states just before i was born i was born a couple more brothers were born and then we moved back to france when i was 14. so i sound very american because i mean my entire childhood was was spent uh, in the States. And then, and your brothers too then have... Uh, two of my four brothers were born and raised in the States, yes. So, the, the so two they have a similarly... Mom... What was that? Go ahead. I was just going to say they have, the, they have the, party, the party trick as well to be able to show up at a party and, and, and be able to bring out that American accent and then yeah. <laughs> switch, switch right into French and, and disturb, <laughs> disturb people with how good they are. It was a trick that we like to use in the metro as with my brother, the closest one in age, uh, him and I always speak to each other in English since we went to American public, public schools in the States. And we'd be, I mean, it, times have changed. Paris is a lot more welcoming to Anglophones now than it was, uh, you know, 25 
shoot, 30, no, how old am I? 40, 25 years ago, <laughs> no, 25 <laughs> years ago when I was in high school, uh, my brother and I would be chatting in English in the Metro and we'd get all these scowls and, you know, stern looks and sometimes nasty comments. And we would hear what people were saying about us, you know, oh, putain d'Americain, grumble, grumble, you know, it's like a grumpy old Parisians. And we'd turn around and just say, excusez-moi, monsieur, est-ce que vous avez l'heure, s'il vous plaît? And their face would just <laughs> drop. <laughs> you know, we'd just politely ask for the time. <laughs> I mean, it's a good it's a good way to put people in their place. the The assumption that because you speak another language, you didn't you don't speak French is pretty preposterous. So um, it's like they they also forget that they ha they are a global capital. Yeah, I mean, the, even um, you know Sadie from Fat Tire, right? I think so. I think I know who yeah, she you, is. Yeah, you you must have you must have bumped into Sadie at least once or twice. Her and I were chit chatting. I was so surprised because this was now only you know I don't know five six years ago. We were walking down the uh, uh, under the Line Six Metro between Duplex and and Mutpique, and there was a market going on. So we were just you know chit chatting and browsing for some lunch food, and we're chit chatting in English. This guy turns around, and you know in a French accent, he says, "You know, you are in Paris. You should be speaking French." And I just, I mean, already it was a stressful day at work, so I was just not having any of this. And so I told him in French that, no, absolutely not. This is a cosmopolitan city. We're in Paris, not in France. We can speak whatever the heck language we want. And he just like. How did, how did that go? <laughs> he, well, he was so shocked that I kind of shouted back to him in French. And uh, so he just kind of, you know, raised his eyebrows. He's like, blah, 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 and then just, you know, turned and walked away. I was, I was very proud of uh, my, my vindicated. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it it it, it happens occasionally. Uh, it's happened to me in the metro. You overhear things. Even now, I mean, probably less than like you said, twenty five years ago. But it's true that when you can, uh, you know, sort of snap back at them and meet them on their, you know, their playing field, they it it definitely creates an unease and gives you the upper hand, of course, but also makes them realize, like, ah, uh, yeah, okay, maybe I was quick to mm -hmm. jump to conclusions, which happens constantly, uh, particularly, I think, in a, in a city like Paris, which we'll get into because, you know, obviously you lead tours and you're with with travelers, but you're also dealing with French, I'm, I'm assuming, at least in the past with, you know, service providers who mm -hmm. are French. So, so anyway, you know, like the evolution has been considerable, but doesn't mean it doesn't still happen. But before we do that and before we talk about Fat Tire, because that you mentioned um, was part of your, your trajectory. So you grew up in you did your your high school and your and the rest of your education in France then. Uh, high school, yeah. The four four years of high school was uh, here in Paris, um, and uh, but then I went back to the United States for college and grad school, and then came back again afterwards. Okay, so you really what's what's also interesting is you've really broken it up, and different sort of key moments of your adulthood has been spent have been spent elsewhere, mm -hmm. or you know, sort of split between the two. Do you, you know, as someone who also sounds perfectly American and also perfectly French, do you feel sort of torn between these two identities? I mean, your family oh, yeah, sounds, totally. you know, hugely, you know, like traditionally French, but how does that complicate things or, or enrich things for you? Um, it complicates things when uh, it, it's mostly in social situations. It complicates things when I'm surrounded by ex by uh, you know, kind of mono, monolingual or monocultural Americans or, or French, because then there's, there's always, I mean, I, like I just mentioned, I feel totally torn between the two. I really feel kind of evenly split, you know, sometimes leaning more heavily one way or the other, depending on the situation or the topic at hand. But there's always that, that, you know, uh, I feel somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. And when I'm in a social situation where, you know, if I was like in Texas for work, then I, I felt very much like the weird kid, you know, on the edge of the circle. And there were certain, you know, local expressions or jokes or just, you know, manners of being that I felt very um, foreign to. And then, the you know, the same thing happens in France. If I'm surrounded by, you know, strictly French people, then I also feel like a bit of an outsider. So it's... It's it's an interesting question. I've been asked it a bunch of times, and uh, I always it's still true to this day. I always just I constantly feel like a little bit of an outsider, no mm -hmm. matter where I go. 
mm-hmm. um, which is one of the reasons why I like working in tourism so much, because oftentimes the people who start working in a big cosmopolitan city in this industry, they're also a little bit, you know, outsiders. They, they showed up from somewhere else, fell in love with the city and decided to stay. And because they came from somewhere else, they have a certain uh, level of language skills and are able to easily break into uh, the, this industry. So, you know, tourism is just, it's a whole bunch of weirdos and outsiders and I feel right. <laughs> <at home. laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess the, the issue when you end up at one of those, you know, parties, like the ones you're describing uh, or gatherings or whatever, is that there's a gap in, in, in understanding, like the, you can't share certain very key experiences mm-hmm. because you're just coming from, and I, I mean, that's true, obviously, if you meet someone who's not uh, a dual national, but of any nationality, but, but I think because it's like you're, you're at home technically in both places that when you don't uh, feel like you can connect or other people can't connect with what you've lived in a place where you would think they could, you know, it becomes a little bit, you mm-hmm. know, um, disorienting but mm-hmm. but i think it's still like a great gift and i wish i had been born into a, a french family i had to you know do all the the legwork myself and get myself the uh the dual situation but uh it, it's true that um you know it doesn't come without its its issues but to to get everybody up to now where you you know what you're doing so you are um you have your own business now mm-hmm. you have a sidecar tour company god that sounds awesome doesn't it (laughs) (laughs) before that so so let's let's back up just a little bit when you were what what, were you studying uh sort of tourism and 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 travel related things in grad school or was it completely separate no no no, no, not at all i have uh out of out of the degrees i have um goodness yeah none of them are related to tourism um (laughs) i just it was it was uh who was that painter bob ross my my whole professional career has been one long happy little accident, you know. <laughs> and um, you could probably do a Bob Ross voice now that I'm thinking about yeah, it. I need to I need to brush up on it. I need to I need to you know get some PBS tapes and <laughs> and practice in front of the mirror. Um, so I uh, I I went to school. Uh, my undergrad degree was in geography. I just found it interesting. There's nothing deeper than that. And then uh, one of my friends was. Uh, um, he had, uh, graduated a year before me and he was, he had done a degree in education. So he was working in a school and he invited me to come to the school to be a speaker during multicultural week. So I went and I spoke in the, in the French classes at that high school and I loved it. So I decided to get to, you know, stay in school for another two years and get my master's in education. But because of my geography degree, I already had a bunch of credit towards the content speciality of social studies. So um, essentially history geography teacher is, uh, is what I, I finished school as. And so I moved back to Paris because I had fallen for a local gal who's now my wife and we have two beautiful little girls. So it was, uh, it was, it was a good move. <laughs> and, and as I was applying to schools in Paris, well, none of them had any vacancies in their <clears throat> history or geography departments. Uh, and it was one of my graduate advisors from, from school that gave me a brochure on fat tire tours. He said, Hey, if you don't find anything in education, try your hand at tourism. Cause I had created a tour for some of the grad students during a conference. And so, excuse me, he got that idea. And, um, and that's exactly what happened. No available jobs in schools. So I emailed fat tire. I was like, you know, I'd like to apply, filled out an application. And they looked at, at me on paper and they're like, Oh, French American with a degree in, in teaching with an education degree. And then, so they had me in and, and thankfully hired me. And after just a few days on the job, I thought, man, this is way too much fun. I'm never going back to a classroom again. And that was, <laughs> that was November, 2008. That was, yeah, we're approaching. Wow. Okay. That was a long time ago. Now yeah. the thing is, is I would disagree with you that you're not applying any of, any of those degrees to your, your current vocation. Of course you are. I mean, a, a natural inclination to teach and storytell. Yeah, it's and a transferable skill set. But I never went to school and studied tourism. Sure. But I don't know, do, do many people study tourism? Yeah, in, and in... they are, t- I shouldn't say this on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Be honest. So for uh, close to a decade, I was uh, in charge of hiring 
people for a tourism company, well, for Fat Tire. And more often than not, the people that would apply with a degree in tourism were just no good. They, I almost never hired them. There's maybe one in a hundred I would actually end up hiring. So what was the discrepancy then in their, in their skill set? Uh, it wasn't necessarily a discrepancy in their skill set. They just never seemed to be like their focus was too narrow. And hmm. I mean, they really, they really wanted to hone a specific part of their tourism degree. And I was like, listen, man, this is, you're not in school anymore. This is the real world. You have to be a tour guide. You have to know how to fix a bike. You know, have to have to know how to deal with people. And it's the people, the people, the people that's that it's, it's the character trait that I found yeah. lacking in a lot of these people coming out of tourism school. I mean, and there was usually a, a local French uh, tourism management program. And the one thing they never really, they, they never really uh, did much of was dealing with large groups of foreigners coming to visit their city. And they just, right. there was that, I don't know, you know, be cliche here, un petit je ne sais quoi, you know, that they didn't have. <laughs> right. Well, I also think that, you know, you study things on paper and you expect it to play out that way in the real life, uh, in the real world. And and also it depends if they ever had, you know, sort of a practical uh, experience with a large group, whether they're French or, or foreign. I mean, you see tour guides in museums taking big groups of French people around. But, you know, um, I think there's something a bit ac like academic or uh, almost too regimented about mm -hmm. Yeah, very much those so. experiences on occasion. That's why I liked hiring people who had a background in education or theater. Oh man, theater people, they were excellent. <laughs> um, so, you know, people with a lot of um, service sector, you know, uh, bartenders, waitresses, mm -hmm. you know, people who didn't necessarily know any of the history of the city or, you know, the theory behind tourism management. Like, I mean, who cares? You learn that on the job. But those, those, uh, that distinct character, character trait that would draw that individual to any kind of job where they get to work with people. They're, they're in their happy place working with a big group of people. All the other hard skills, those are easy to learn. You right. can't teach someone how to enjoy working with people. So, you know, 2008 to, you know, many crises that we've had in Paris that have uh, upended for a time or, or severely disrupted tourism the yellow vest movement, which I'm sure most people have forgotten about uh, because of COVID, but I was just thinking about that earlier today. Yeah, No, I, um, there are moments when I'm like, wait, what year was that again? But you know, we really had a six, like a succession of, of really disruptive events just before COVID up. Yeah. Oh, there's going to be a transport strike. You're going to well. see a cat, by the way, our listeners will not get to see him. But uh, if you see a cat walk by, that's that's what that is. Um, <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I'm sort of wondering how, if you were to put your finger on the biggest evolution in the tourism industry, as you work in it, or as you've worked in it uh, since 2008, what would you say it has been? Lindsay, that is a doozy of a I know, I'm, I, <laughs> you, people come on here for a challenge, Simon. <laughs> So I, do I really have to? Just no, no, on? of course not. <laughs> okay, okay. This isn't a game show. Um, I would say, I mean, it's, this is something that I've always, um, I've always noticed also just through, through history that the greatest kind of leaps and advances are always after some kind of disaster, right? Uh, economic recession, Warfare, plague, you know, th those kind of things. So uh, when if you put the magnifying glass on just the Paris tourism industry, uh, I guess the f the first the first big one was uh, was yet yeah, the uh, the the recession in what was that? 2007, 2008? Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, 2008. Yeah. So right when you so were getting started, specifically because. Yeah, it was just when I was getting started. So d this is mostly from just what I was hearing because I didn't work the 2007, six, you know, in, in previous seasons, but from what I kept hearing was that had influenced a change, especially in the demographic of, uh, in the traveler demographic coming through Paris. 
especially working for a bike tour company, you'd hear all these stories of, you know, stinky backpackers and stuff. It was a very affordable tour. So, you know, people walking up without reservations. But starting in 2008, because of the recession, the traveler demographic shifted to, you know, people who could afford to travel. So those are also the people who would book ahead of time. So there was a steady decrease in no reservation walk up uh, customers. Um, I can't really go into more detail than that because, you know, I was just sure, sure, sure. Uh, wasn't wasn't looking at it from from above. Uh, and then, I mean, personally, 2015, uh, the terrorist attacks in Paris, that created a, a kind of black hole in tourism just around Paris. Nobody was coming to Paris yeah. anymore. Generally France, but especially Paris. 2016 was a, what was, we did about less than, less than mm. half uh, of the revenue of the previous season. So that was when I had to learn how to uh, do economic redundancy packages for, for permanent staff, <laughs> learn that on the job. Um, and but when when tourism came back in 2017, the industry itself had become far more fragmented. Prior to that, there were a few big tour operators and a few big kind of you know travel agencies. Everybody that ended up losing their jobs um, or not being able to be hired back because of that 2016 terrible year. Well, I mean, they had been they had spent a, a sizable chunk of their career in tourism and loved it. And tourism only came back one year later. So they all they all ended up opening their, you know, their, their, their small independent businesses. So the the offer to travelers had greatly increased in 2017 hmm. for 2017, 18, 19. You know. And then uh, there was the the pandemic that was by far the, the biggest disruptive force. It was painful. But it really accelerated uh, not even just travel, but I mean, France needed this push to accelerate towards a more digital uh, level of or, uh, to a more uh, to a higher level of comfort with all things hmm. digital. I mean, you remember trying to do any administrative work prior to the pandemic? It was all paper, everything done in triplicate. It's true. And everything, every government office now has a functioning, easy to use website. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that um, it seems that it pushed also a lot of people to expand what tourism could be, uh, whether it's yeah. <clears throat> incorporating a virtual component that they can still maintain today, whether they, you know, whether that's actually uh, profitable is another story, but there's a flexibility and maybe an adaptability that everyone sort of needed to be pushed into developing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that obviously yeah, yeah, for sure, a lot of companies were able to somewhat rest on their laurels because of their, 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 their tenure in the local tourism industry, but all those other new ones that, that are really making a, a concerted effort to develop their digital presence and do all sorts of interesting things online it's just chipping away at the big ones and they're noticing more and more that, you know, year over year, it's, they're kind of, you know, they're shrinking a little bit. It's harder and harder to match previous years, you know, discounting the pandemic. It's harder and harder to match previous years level of, of uh, activity. And uh, everybody, travelers especially are doing everything, you know, in hand, mobile, digital. And so if you're, if your offerings as a, tour operator or tour company aren't easing that path to purchase on a cell phone right. or mobile phone, whatever you call them now, um, then, uh, then it's, it's, you know, it's just going to be a struggle. So let's talk about then how you also created your own path to, you know, to creating a space uh, in, in the tourism landscape for yourself that is purely independent now. So, so tell, you know, where did the idea come from? for a sidecar business? Cause you know, you've done bikes, you clearly have done management, but like, how does the sidecar fit into this? So, well, during the pandemic, um, I, I mean, I was, I was the human resources director for fat tire tours, but I didn't have a degree in HR management. So I got my degree in a French, uh, 
university. They had an online program uh, for a master's degree for HR management. So I did that during the pandemic. And then after I started letting go of some permanent staff a, a year into the pandemic, I knew my days were numbered. So I started applying to HR jobs and I realized HR outside of tourism is boring. <laughs> and I did not want to, I didn't want to pers- to continue to pursue after almost 10 years uh, doing HR for a tourism company. Uh, I realized that if, if it wasn't for tourism, I wasn't interested. So um, the idea struck me uh, when I was at my parents' house in the Southwest of France. Um, and I realized that okay, you know, maybe this really is the time to do something independently. It was actually a conversation with a taxi driver. No way. He was bringing us to the train station. And I was just gutted that I was going back to Paris just to, you know, finish letting go of people. And, uh, and the, the guy said, you know, if you, if you want to make it here, I was, I was trying to figure out how to stay in the southwest of France. He said, if you want to make it here, you have to be independent. And then it just, it just hit me that nobody was – offering sidecar tours in the Southwest on the, on the Atlantic coast. And, and it could work. And just for the four hour train ride back to Paris, that is the only thing I thought about, about all the pitfalls, uh, the potential and everything. And the minute I got home and my wife and I put the kids to bed, I just sat down and put everything, you know, in an Excel spreadsheet, word document, put all of, all of my thoughts over the past four hours down on, on the, on my computer. Uh, and I thought, okay, you know, I'll just, you know, chew on this for a little bit. And I just couldn't get the idea out of my head for weeks. But, but so I, why a sidecar? Like that was one of the first things that came to your mind? Because I've always, I've always loved motorcycles. Okay. And okay. Um, I knew that uh, a tourism, running tours on motorcycles, you can do it in one of two ways. Either it's a multi-day excursion for motorcyclists. So there's, you know, a lead a uh, rider and then everybody else is on rented bikes or their own bikes following the lead rider. But, you know, having small children and, you know, not really ever having much experience in the multi-day tour space, which is a different beast. Um, I thought, well, why not with a sidecar? Cause there's someone else doing that in Paris. They've been doing it since 2015. So I thought maybe I can transplant that down to the Southwest and that way I can open up uh, the, uh, the, my kind of, you know, target audience, target clientele to people who don't have motorcycle licenses. So it's a much, much wider net to cast. And then, you know, long story short, talking to the missus, I realized that I don't know anybody in the tourism space in the Southwest of France. Um, I've only ever lived there, you know, during summer holidays, Christmas. And, you know, I mean, I was never really a resident down there. Um, so, you know, and why uproot our children? So why not just do it in Paris where I know a bunch of people? And so I decided to do it here, but I kept the name that I had come up with to do it in the Southwest as kind of a wink. And it sounds cooler. Um, the name of the business is Chango Tours, T-X-A-N-G-O, Chango, which is a Basque word that means excursion. Uh-huh. Well, it's actually pretty multi-purpose excursion, leisurely outing, travel by unconventional means. It's just, I figured it was the perfect word. And with tours afterwards, it's a little, you know, alliterative. Is that, is that a problem? Is that a yes. real English word? Alliterative? Yes, it is. And, um, and so, uh, so yeah, so, and then Chango Tours was born. And so I, I mean, what I liked about it when I first heard what you were doing was that it's a really different way of seeing Paris, right? You know, it's much different from, yeah, there are off the beaten path walking tours and bike tours and, you know, people doing these like very expensive little cruises on the Seine, uh, which, you know, come with a certain, not only a price tag, but a certain offering, um, you know, food and beverage and this and that. But it seems like if ever there was a city that could uh, offer such a variety of ways of experiencing the city, it's Paris. So Mm -hmm. what, where do you take people? And in the, in the time that you've been doing it, what is the feedback you've been getting from people? Like, is it just about the thrill of being in the sidecar or like, what is, what, what, is, what are people taking away from it uh, the most? The, I think what, well, I shouldn't say, I think I know because people have been saying this. Um, it's, it's definitely twofold. They go into it expecting at least the thrill of the sidecar that, I mean, that's, you know, that's the first thing you see it's eye catching, looks cool. 
you know, you're on three wheels, so there's yaw. It's, it's uh, um, you know, very sensory experience. Um, but what people are not necessarily always expecting is walking away from a tour actually kind of understanding Paris a little bit. Because I, I like to, from my tourism background and teaching background, I'd like to actually give a proper cohesive tour and do some storytelling so that people walk away, um, you know, having a better sense of why Paris is the way it is, why Parisians are the way they are. And, um, you know, walking away feeling a little bit more educated about the city they're visiting, but at the same time having fun. Yeah. And I think that's, that's part of it. People are looking for that balance of fun and educational and, um, <laughs> you know, something memorable, right? So memorable is the word that comes up a lot now. And, and especially given what people are, you know, they're not necessarily looking to spend all their money on things. So they want some some sort of an experience that's going to really stick in their yeah. mind. And obviously, a sidecar is something you're not going to forget. Um, what are, are, do you focus on specific neighborhoods? Or do you have one route that you essentially take people through? So for this uh, inaugural season, I had um, I had a couple, well, there's the, the best seller, which was the Paris monuments tour as a, a loop starting from near the Eiffel tower all the way to depending on timing and traffic. We sometimes make it to the Louvre, but can't guarantee that, but definitely make it to, you know, the Arc de Triomphe, l'Opéra Garnier, Concord square, you know, all the, you know, the, the typical monuments. So it's, it's a total bucket list type of tour. It's like, ah, I'm going to tick all these boxes and do it in a sidecar. Go. So that one uh, that that one sells quite well, and it's a it's a standard standard route. Um, but then there, I mean, there's so much history there, so many stories that I, you know I can do the same tour four times in a day, and I'm always talking about something different. Uh, and then I have an off the beaten path tour, which I used to call the Vice and Violence tour because I thought it sounded cooler. <laughs> and I mean that's it's because it's essentially what I talk about on that tour is the Vice and Violence through the ages of Paris in the Latin Quarter and Montmartre. We do. It's, it's oh yeah, there's a lot loop. to be said about yeah. those areas in those two yeah. worlds. Yeah, so you know, going back all the way to the Romans, and you know, I mean, it's uh, you know, from yeah, pretty much from Rome all the way until the Commune of 1871. So there's uh, there's a whole ton of crazy stuff, history of prostitution. We you know stop at a brothel as well. I mean, it's not a brothel anymore, but it was. Um, I actually was just doing that. That was my last tour yesterday. Um, this, uh, retired, uh, Navy mechanic, he was cool. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but that, that one, it, it doesn't sell as well because it's quite long. It's about three and a half hours. Uh, and so also more expensive. So I'm thinking of like splitting that and doing like a secrets of the left bank mm -hmm. and violence in Montmartre, but you know, we'll see how I, I need to, I need to play around with it. I haven't had much time in front of my computer for the past four or five months. Uh, yeah, so, um, because as you've seen, tourism has rebounded in a massive oh yeah. way. Um, that was time. that was the other big piece I wanted to talk to you about before I, you know, leave you to your Monday to recover. Um, it, it honestly feels like we flipped a switch and or the floodgates, whatever sort of image you'd like to, to use, and everyone came pouring in. And it, it felt like sort of like the revenge, the COVID revenge tour, like everyone's like, you're not going to oh, yeah. like, keep me out of, you know, Europe for long. And, and everyone really did come back and sort of make up for lost time. Did you get the sense that um, the return felt even stronger than after the 2016 lull that you experienced? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Big time. The the after the 2016 lull, tourism returned more progressively. Um, I mean, it also you know it's a question of how far does the pendulum swing, right? The 2016 lull was was nothing compared to what we saw in 2020, 2021. Mm -hmm. So it, was, it only meant over that over a two year duration. So it, it only makes sense that the, the pendulum swinging back is going to swing back that much harder. Um. But yeah, it's been it's been excellent. And on top of it, uh, there are no Russians and there are no Chinese tourists. So I've, I have nothing against Russians or Chinese, but the the fact that you have those two traveler demographics that are not present just leaves more room for other travelers. So there, I mean, the there are more Latin Americans this year than I've ever noticed before. Right. Constantly have. 
uh, Mexicans, Brazilians, Argentinians, people stopping me while I'm in the middle of a speech with my group. <laughs> they come and they're pestering me to take photos with the sidecar and stuff. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, there's uh, th- there's a whole ton of people and there's more room for them because it's especially the, the way the Chinese consume their local tourism here because right. they, they come in buses yeah. and they don't uh, they don't book local uh, tour experiences. No. They usually have a tour guide from their from the Chinese tour company in China. They have a Chinese tour guide that comes with them from China to France and they stay together the whole time and move around as a giant group. So without without those those groups present in the city, there's just more room for for everybody else. Right. And also, I think, um, you know, the 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 service providers or the places that most benefit from those big tourism groups are places like Galerie Lafayette, the stores that they go to. And actually, as a little anecdote, I had an Uber driver um, recently who's who was a Chinese French Chinese man in a Tesla. And I was like, this is a really nice car. I mean, I don't like Teslas, but meaning like sort of like a higher end car for this sort of, you know, VTC business. And he's like, well, actually, this isn't my normal business. I usually am a dedicated driver for when Chinese uh, travelers come over to Paris. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and he was like, because they only work with their own, essentially. And and he said his wife works at Galerie Lafayette. And I said, wow, they must be really hurting because of the, the lack of Chinese tourism right now. And he said, well, they represent almost 50% of the store's business. And part of it, like you were describing, is they come in these big groups. And when family back in China knows that you know someone is going, they give money to buy mm-hmm. these you know products that cost less because of the detox and all of that. And so in in the span of like two hours, they may spend four or five grand on product at Galerie Lafayette. I just thought the numbers were astounding, right? So of course, certain places and, and, and shops and what have you are going to feel that absence more. But certainly the the streets feel a little bit less uh, stifled because there's not the same level of, you know, the tour buses taking up space and, and whatnot. Um, but you're you're right. I think that the, the Latin American, South American population has come in a big way to to explore. And we know that Brazil was already sort of on the rise as a as a tourism demographic even before COVID, but it sounds like, you know, people are using this as an opportunity to explore Paris if they've never done it before. It's like, oh, yeah. why am I going to wait any longer? Exactly. Um, yeah. So what can what can we say about the sidecar experience to leave people with a little a little something, a little, a little bit of desire and wanting? Um, w- What's one thing you want people to sort of understand about the experience if they're going to do this with you? The um, I mean, I always thought that the beauty of a sidecar, it's it's not for the actual driver. As a motorcyclist, it's kind of a pain in the butt because I got this big thing next to me. I can't weave through traffic as easily. You know, it's all the inconvenience of a motorcycle and the inconvenience of a car rolled into one. But for a traveler, it's the exact opposite because there's the convenience of being chauffeured around town and there's no inconvenience of having to manipulate a a piece of equipment like on a bicycle tour or on a a traditional motorcycle tour they're not the ones having to worry about something that has been given to them by the company or rented or whatever and they can just fully take in everything that is happening around them there's no filter from like a bus window or a car window you know you really feel totally exposed to, to the city and the sights and the smells and the sounds and, and everything without, without having to worry about, you know, where to turn and don't hit that curb. Don't hit that pedestrian. That's, that's my job. That's job. <laughs> well, so it sounds like it really is a unique way of seeing the city, which I would encourage everyone to try to do no matter what form uh, they're going to experience it. You know, just see something different when you come. Uh, Simon, awesome, awesome idea. Uh, so great talking to you, and I hope that everyone comes to check out Chango Tours. Thank you, Lindsay. It's been great talking to you, too. That's the show for today. As always, thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing with friends. You can find all previous episodes of the New Paris Podcast wherever you stream your podcasts and on World Radio Paris. If you're enjoying these conversations, please consider picking up a copy of the New Paris book or my recent release, The New Parisienne, from your local booksellers. 
Until next time, adiento. Adiento.